Hello, welcome everybody to this new panel at the Next TV series Caribbean 2022. Around the world, all of the large operators are embarked on a critical reconversion process to upgrade their traditional pay TV offerings to really more sophisticated products based on full IP video distribution. We're just coming, we, we saw in, in the preceding panel how in the Caribbean, the largest uh, regional players such as uh, Liberty or, or Digital are really taking exactly this approach. However, this doesn't mean that smaller operators can also join this model. In fact, uh, over the past couple of years, we have seen a clear trend emerge across Latin America and the Caribbean uh, with a growing number of small cable operators and ISPs who are looking to add value to their broadband users with innovative business services that are aligned with these new way in which generations are consuming content. Yeah, so I hear some echo there. Probably someone needs to mute. Uh, there, there you go. Um, now, of course, the big question is, can this be done at a reasonable cost and in a sustainable fashion? Uh, so let me introduce the three very knowledgeable industry experts who will join me during this session to answer this and other fascinating questions about the latest developments, the new opportunities and the future challenges facing telecom operators in the Caribbean. Um, Stephen Curran is the CTO at Cable Bahamas. Uh, he's joining us uh, out of Jamaica today. Rafael Pichardo is the Network Operations Manager, OTT Platform Management and Development uh, at Wind Telecom, uh, uh, Dominican Republic operator, and Xavier Leclerc, Vice President of Business Development at Broadpeak, joining us from London, about to get on a plane to Prague. Uh, so welcome all uh, gentlemen. Uh, Stephen, let me start with you. Uh, Tell us, what is the state of this technology migration from legacy to fiber networks in general in the Caribbean and in particular at Cable Bahamas? Well, in general in the Caribbean, there is a lot of um, customers who still are on DSL technology, that twisted pair of copper, which has been you know, 100 years old. Um, some operators are using HFC, uh, cable uh, fiber, fiber coax, which is what we have in, in Cape Bahamas. And then, of course, the new operators like you sell up move to fiber to the home. Of course, the holy grail is fiber to the home. Everyone wants mm -hmm. to move towards that technology, but it's a cost problem. Uh, of course, as you mentioned as well, there are wireless operators as well. I, I'm, a, I'm a wireless guy, so I always mention wireless. Mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, just for video distribution, I'm sure Rafael will agree, it's very, very difficult if every single one of your customers is streaming large amounts of video if you have a wireless network. It yeah. gets quite tricky with the bandwidth, which is why fiber to the home is, is, the, uh, is the ultimate uh, thing that everyone's aiming for. So we're in the middle of a process to expand our fiber to the home network in the Bahamas. We've already, what we managed to do was uh, one of the, the good side effects of a, of a terrible tragedy was the damage after Hurricane Dorian in, in one of the islands called Abaco. We had a rather large HFC plant there, but when we came to rebuild it, we rebuilt it with fiber mm -hmm. to the home. Made sense, made sense, okay. Um, Rafael, um, Wind Telecom in the Dominican Republic has historically used wireless uh, as its access uh, technology. I think the company name gives Wind. it away, right? Wind Telecom yeah. uh, uh, is uh, connected with that. But the company has also started right now to, uh, I think, GPON Fiber Infrastructure, which is the, usually the key uh, technology choice whenever fiber deployments uh, are, are rolled out. What is the status of that sort of transition at uh, Wind Telecom? Yeah, as as Steven said, it's basically the main goal of almost any ISP to to get fiber as near as possible to the to the customer. Uh, you get a lot of all the bandwidth that you would need to to do streaming, to do data, anything. So yes, we're basically starting the deployment of of a couple of networks or, or a network, a GPON network. And for the moment, it's, it's basically a connectivity. It's only for internet, but it's, it's on the scope to add video to it and, and other, other features as well. Okay, so we will 
touch on that uh, later on in, in the discussion. Um, Stephen, the, the next natural step, uh, as uh, Raphael was uh, suggesting for operators that migrate to FTTH infrastructure, would be to also upgrade the video operations to all IP distribution. How do you envision this process taking place across the Caribbean? Well, again, I just say for my company, we, we do have IPTV already. We offer that as a product to the our fibers to home customers. And of course, as you transfer then from HFC, you know, linear quantum TV, then onto IPTV, that, that's going to be a natural progression as well. And um, this R fog step that some of the companies went in, I never really liked that as a technology. I thought that was a bit, it was just, it was needed at the time, but these days, uh, native IPTV applications on Android set top boxes is, is probably the way to go for cable TV operators. That's the, again, that's the holy grail. And all IP inside the person's home. Uh, and also as well as I keep insisting, hardwired to the Android TV boxes. I don't like this idea of using Wi-Fi distribution inside the homes, just because it might work in the States where you've got nice drywall or, you know, but in, in the Caribbean with the very thick, thick walls, I always caution everybody about using Wi-Fi for in-home TV distribution. If you can run a cable, please do that. It'll just save you, it's a bit more trouble at installation time, but it'll save you so many problems down the road by having a, a wired uh, infrastructure for inside the home for your IPTV distribution. That's a good point, isn't it? The, the thick walls in the Caribbean of, of infrastructure just to, to be able to, to weather the storms literally and make it quite tricky to, to do Wi-Fi. That's a very good point. Um, uh, Rafael, uh, Wind Telecom already has experience in terms of migrating from a legacy digital pay TV to a pure play OTT pay TV offering. Tell us what motivated the company to transition to full streaming uh, pay TV and, and what is the current state of development of your new OTT platform? Well, initially what, what pushed us to, to that migration was more of a regu regulatory uh, issue, but we had a lot of- uh, so you, you were occupying MMDS frequency had, bands had, and you needed we, to release we, those, okay. Yes, yeah. we, had, we had an MMDS and and for regulatory issues, we had to conceive those uh, licenses and those frequencies. For written. mobile services. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, and uh, all, all of that because of 5G. Yep. Because of the deployment of 5G. And, yep. and basically, that pushed push the, the decision. But the administration was already uh, thinking and in, in, in wrapping their heads, heads on, on a project that I... I I, I presented er, earlier on, and that basically was this OTT solution. That how can I say it? It's 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 basically a, a solution that tries to emulate or, or to have all the the key elements of a an, an, a legacy solution, a video solution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, and what's the status of, of that development at the moment? Excuse me? What's the status of, of the OTT platform? Has it already been launched, it's operational? It's yeah, it's, it's operational. We have around three years of, 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 the, of, of operations with it. And on the, on, on the current stage, we're trying to expand, adding some more content and, and adding some more aggregations so we can, we can accommodate more customers to it. And basically, we're working with low balancing and, and failover of all our services. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Xavier, what do, you, what do you observe in the market when telecom operators have the opportunity to deploy a TV solution in a greenfield operation? What's, what's happening there? What's, what's the, what are the key trends for greenfield operations? Yeah, so I'm um, just listening here, you know, the experience from wind and cable biomass, I think that tells us, you know, moving into uh, fiber creates new opportunities, right? Creates the opportunity to introduce new technology. And I think there are probably three, um, three angles to that, right? So with, um, you know, fiber technology, FTTC or FTTH, this is rather an opportunity to simplify parts of the network, right? So similar to uh, what uh, Stephen was describing for um, Cable Bahamas, uh, I can take an example of Mega Cable, one of our customers in Mexico. Um, they basically had a, a cable footprint, so traditional DVB-C distribution, HFC network and DVB-C distribution on the network. 
and they expanded their footprint with fiber, right? And that basically gives them the opportunity to introduce a full ABR proposition, right? You know, in their eyes, it didn't make any sense to bring the legacy stack onto fiber, right? So they didn't want to bring conditional access. They didn't want to have a hard drive inside the set-top box anymore. So they moved everything to a pure IP streaming uh, proposition. So using CDN, using multicast ABR for distribution, using cloud DVR for uh, the recording, all right? So getting rid of the, the hard drive in the process. And, you know, for us, we very, very much see that as, you know, the right opportunity to basically change the uh, proposition inside the home, right? Um, we already started talking about Android TV. I think uh, the main benefit of Android TV is having an open ecosystem. So basically an ecosystem in which you can easily bring uh, additional applications. So whether it's Android TV or RDK, RDKV is um, somehow popular too these days uh, we think it's important to have basically a set top box that will accommodate um, services from other ott providers right so on the same set top box you have your operator tv but you also have your amazon prime your disney plus and your netflix all in one place and that's at the end of the day what customers want today they want this more rounded solution and um, that gives them access to multiple sources right so i think you know this is interesting you move from you know one access technology to the other and you find obviously you know opportunities to introduce you know inflection points to introduce new uh, new technologies um, and i think here you know i need to mention the cloud as well uh, we see more and more interest you know for the cloud more and more functions of video being pushed to the clouds like cdn selection analytics targeted at advertising that can be easily offloaded to a public cloud environments, right? And the main drivers there are going to be time to market and reducing the risk, right? It's a lot easier to deploy it. It's less risky in terms of project timelines and, and upfront costs. So, um, so we see a lot of interest for cloud-based solutions today. Yeah, that, that was, uh, I was going to ask about that because it's really literally everybody talking about cloud being the, the most convenient environment these days for practically every single new process and, and operation. So it makes sense to, to hear that. Uh, would you say the, the latest OTT pay TV operations are migrating to a 100% cloud-based uh, ecosystem? Is that what you're seeing, Alton? That's a good question, Juan. Right? I think my answer would be not necessarily, right? Mm. Um, like I said, there is an appetite to host some of the functions in the public cloud. So your mm. AWS, your Azure, your Google Cloud. And we work with a number of telcos want to outsource as many functions as possible, right? Um, but what we see is that it doesn't always make sense, mm. right? If you look at the public cloud, uh, processing and storing data is cheap, right? It's very easy to uh, you know store and process data in the cloud. Um, but when you look at video, what you need to do is move a lot of data out of the cloud, right? And this is where the public cloud is expensive because you pay per gigabyte delivered, right? So this actually prevents some OTT providers from delivering 4K services at scale. They basically tell us it's just too expensive. If I work with you know, a public cloud or if I work with a global CDN, it's just too expensive for me to deliver a 4K uh, experience today, right? So this is where the ISPs have an advantage here because it's their own network, you know, they operate their own network. Delivery of the video is always going to be um, cheaper from an on-prem CDN, an infrastructure that you build inside the network. So it's going to be more, ex more effective than relying on a third-party CDN, right? And the third-party CDN will anyway use the ISP network to deliver the video, right? So here, I think logically it makes a lot more sense to basically have your delivery functions whenever you're going to be delivering a lot of video, have it inside your network, have it as close as you can to the end users because we know proximity means quality. The closer you are to the end user, the better quality you're going to have. But for some functions that don't touch the video, you know, like I said, the CDN selection, analytics, targeted advertising, for example, you can easily push that to the cloud. So for me, it's not necessarily one or the other. It's not necessarily 100% public cloud or on-prem um, capacity. I think they're actually complementary. And uh, maybe one picture, I'm a picture person, right? One picture is, you know, how how maybe the general public is using, you know, Uber or a taxi against their own cars, right? I think in some cases, it makes sense to have your own car. If you drive to work every day, you're probably going to take your car. But once in a while, you need to travel, you know, maybe to the airport or, you know, travel, uh, 
you know, going out or something. And this is where uh, an Uber is going to be more expensive. So it's going to be more convenient. So <laughs> maybe a little bit more expensive, but more convenient at the same time, right? So I think this is this is the balance we're trying to find here in video as well. Some functions are going to be very cheap to run on the cloud. They're going to be very effective. Some of the functions are going to be better hosted on-prem to give you the cost and also the quality the customers are expecting. Good point. Very well explained. I'd like to translate this, uh, the experiences that our two operators are having uh, in terms of their interactions uh, with the cloud. Stephen, uh, how do you expect in general the cloud to, to transform your video operations at Cable Behemoth? Uh, exactly as Xavier said, that it's, 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 a, it's a hybrid approach. He's completely right. Mm -hmm. Just one of the points I'll mention as well is Cable Behemoth are quite lucky in that we have our own fiber infrastructure back home into the United States. So we basically have a big pipe goes that, that lands in Florida. A lot of operators of the Caribbean don't have that luxury. So they've got to pay for, you know, one or 10 or, you know, we have 20 gigabit per second uh, off-island capacity. And that can be very, very expensive. So again, if you have a centralized head end in, in Florida, it, it seems like a great idea in paper until you've got to try and find the backhaul to get all that, uh, that HD and 4K all the way to your, uh, all the way to your head end in, you know, Jamaica or, or Dom Rep or wherever you're going to be. That's, that's an excellent point. Again, the hybrid approach is, is exactly right. The, 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 the value add, the analytics, maybe the advertising, you know, maybe the pay-per-view movies, that kind of stuff you can put out on the cloud and then maybe leave the linear, the 4K stuff, um, ingest that in the head end in the country and then use that for distribution. So again, it, the hybrid approach is, is, is probably the way it's going to go. I agree. Okay. And um, Rafael, I understand that you're using the cloud strategically to avoid having to rely on external CDNs for, for your video streaming product. How does this setup work? And, and how do you determine where to connect each new video client request in, in real time? How is that process? How are you managing that process at the moment? Yeah, the, the idea basically is this whole uh, uh, system or systems has been built by us. So we have a lot of control, all the control of how everything works and what happens when mm. and basically we have a lot of pieces that were developed just to to do that uh, low balance and and have clients uh, connect to one 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 server on, or another basically we have we have a, a cdn that's built in between uh, our premises our head end and and a couple of serv uh, servers uh, on on the on the cloud, as mm -hmm. Xavier said, it's it's the best idea is to have it uh, as hybrid, hybrid as possible and and to have the content as closer to the client as possible, mm -hmm. and that's basically what we're we're looking for to have all services uh, close and 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 with the best warranty possible. Okay, thanks for that. And uh, I'll stay with uh, both Stephen and, and Raphael. The large US MVPDs, the, the, the cable companies, uh, large cable companies in, in the US are really all building the next generation video offerings around the concept of super aggregation. Yeah. Well, they're essentially bundling a growing number of third-party OTT apps within their own set of boxes or even the, their streaming platforms. Should smaller operators, you think, in the Caribbean adopt a similar strategy? And, and what challenges do they face uh, if they are to do something like this, uh, Stephen? Yeah, it's, it's a very good point. I, I think the problem is the scale. That the, we as a small operator, we find the likes of Netflix and, and Amazon Prime, they really don't want to talk to us. We're just too small. Now, the holy grail is, of course, you go onto your fire stick and you set it up and you just click a button and then it all just neatly falls into place. You don't have to go between the different tiles to get your different applications. I'd love that. That would be amazing, even as a consumer. But it's just, we, we've left the realm of engineering and now we're going towards content management and content rights and all that lovely stuff. And that's really what the problem is. It's, engineering wise, it's, it's very simple as an engineer to, well, not simple. It's got a bit of challenges to it, but it's not the big deal. The big deal is that, these Netflix's, Amazon Prime, Hulu, they don't want to talk to you. You're just too small. Yeah, that it's it's basically a, a commercial issue, not, not a technical mm -hmm. one. I, I agree 100% with, with Stephen. Uh, very good point. And you hear that over and over uh, talking to not only small operators, I have to say. We've, we've come across operators with 
around a million subscribers who tell me the same thing. And Netflix won't sit down and, and, and talk to me. Xavier, how can telecom operators overcome these barriers in, in such an increasingly fragmented uh, OTT market? What role do they have left to play in, in this new game? It's um, an interesting time, I think, now, right? Um, like you mentioned, there is more and more um, push to become the super aggregator, right? So providing one box with all the uh, OTTs embedded. And yes, there can be challenges with the big players, you know, wanting to, uh, you know, get engaged with a, a certain level of um, subscribers. Um, I think I think it's a process, right? I think we're very much at at the beginning of it. Um, I think first seeing operators moving to pure streaming solutions is the right approach, right? Because that basically opens the door to more collaboration with the OTT players, right? So if you look at uh, Sky, for example, in the UK here, Sky is a satellite operator. They have launched a, a Sky Glass proposition, so a connected TV. You can rent a TV from Sky and you get all your Sky content and the apps already embedded inside the TV. Uh, you don't use the satellite dish anymore. It's pure streaming. Um, if you look at Liberty Global, you know, similar proposition being launched across Europe and I think some parts of Latin America um, with a, a set-top box that is pure IP again, right? So you get a connected, you get an IP set-top box similar to a Roku device, but very simple and with all the applications integrated. So I think this is where we're heading. But like you said, those are the big guys, right? The people who have a lot of, of subscribers. I think what we're seeing in the market is this idea of collaboration is gaining a lot of traction. Right. And especially um, when we look at, um, you know, combining OTT services uh, that are live, not VOD, OT, live OTT services with ISPs, because this is when, you know, we create big problems. Right. OTT with VOD, the Netflix, the uh, traditional Amazon Prime for on demand, this is relatively easy to deliver because it's a volume game. You deliver a lot of the video on the network, but you don't necessarily create a high peak of traffic. Mm. What we've observed in Europe um, is when live content moves to OTT. So if you take, for example, the football in Italy, football used to be broadcasted by Sky, again, over a, over a satellite or a, a terrestrial network. This has moved to a streaming proposition and is now offered by the zone, right? The zone is the Netflix of sports. They acquire a lot of the premium rights and they offer basically a streaming bundle um, from where you can get basically, for example, the Italian football, okay? So that means in Italy, if you have, you know, if you want to watch the Serie A, the top football, um, you will need a dozen, you need today a dozen subscription. And that creates a problem for the operators, right? Because, you know, instantly, you know, you have a game on, you have, I don't know, the classic uh, Milan against uh, Turin, you know, playing together, um, and maybe you have the South, I don't know, Napoli playing Rome, and that can drive very high audiences, right? You can get 10 million streams all starting at the same time. And again, here we're talking about streaming. So ABR distribution, traditionally working with a CDN, right? So we're talking very aggressive ramp up rate. Imagine 10 million streams ramping up in, you know, 15, 20, 30 minutes. Um, this is very aggressive. And that creates a challenge for the ISP because this is um, the peak of the traffic basically may require more capacity than is available today in the networks, right? So this is where we run into problems of, you know, capacity, not having enough bandwidth available, having poor experience, you know, for the end user. And I think this is where the model is changing, right? I think today the OTTs recognize that they need to work with ISPs to deliver the right experience. So, you know, what were we talking about about uh, scale and size, you know, I think it's a, you know, hopefully a temporary effect with, you know, in time, more of the OTT players wanting to collaborate with more ISPs to deliver the right experience. And for me, you know, what we've seen with the zone in Italy, um, they've worked very closely with Telecom Italia, where we have deployed a multicast ABR uh, proposition. Today, we see basically the zone using the multicast distribution of Telecom Italia. Right, so it's streaming delivered to you know multiple devices, to set top boxes, connected TVs, iPads, and it's basically being delivered using multicast inside the ASP network. This is for me a very good example of how the collaboration works better because ah. the, the OTT gets a better experience at the end, and the network operator basically also saves money. They don't have to build a giant network, you know, oversize the capacity for uh, the specific needs of an OTT. So I think this is where we're going to be heading: the super aggregation, but with more collaboration. You know, let's do things together for the benefit of our joint customers. Because at the end, you know, if a customer has a bad experience, they may blame the OTT or they may blame the ISP, right? So it's in everybody's interest to satisfy the customer. I think. 
good point, and and I think you well you provided the example of sports uh, in Europe with Sky and the Sun, but uh, uh, we're not very far off from a similar situation in Latin America, where some of the large sports, especially sports media groups, are also moving, migrating their content exclusively to streaming, and you end up yeah. with a similar similar problem. So similar problem, uh, yeah. Same bottlenecks, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Good to hear there are solutions for for those upcoming new problems. Uh, <laughs> Rafael, in in your case, you decided to go for an in-house OTT de uh, development, as as you just said which is not really, it has to be said, the most usual approach these days. What are the advantages and the challenges of, of having to put every piece of this uh, engineering puzzle together by yourself instead of going for a typical SaaS, a software as a service a solution? Yeah, basically the, the advantages in, are that we have control of all, all the processes and all all we need to add a feature is just to have it well documented and and and, and start developing. It's not it's not easy, but it's not as hard as <laughs> as it sounds. But that beco that becomes the main challenge because you have all these pieces on the table that have to work together and have a smooth outcome. Because everything has to has to be as 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 silk as possible, just to have a, a good product to to the to the customer, and and that basically it, it develops that game that that you have all that that flexibility on on the on the platform, because we can uh, do any feature we we think about and and maybe deploy it on our record time, but it has to be deployed thinking of, of all the pieces that's, that's going to be around. On a SaaS solution, you, you be, you're you basically close with a, a, a group of features, and all those features are, are going to work as, as promised, but mm -hmm. you're, you don't have the same, the same flexibility. Okay. Um, Stephen, um... Stephen and Rafael, you mentioned, Rafael, that you were having to release your spectrum for the upcoming 5G cellular services. When do you expect, I ask Stephen first, the first 5G cellular services to, to be launched in the Caribbean and, and what impact will this new technology have on broadband and, and video distribution in the region, do you think? Well, there are some 5G services already. I believe Trinidad has 5G, and I'm just. I, did you mention public because there has been some work on the 5G? Yeah. There, I believe there has as well. Uh, the the English-speaking Caribbean islands, not so much yet. Um, it's a bit of a chicken and an egg. You, you need enough devices in the marketplace, uh, uh, user terminals, uh, uh, cell phones, and CPEs with 5G enabled to make it worth your while, and then you have to have the 5G network to make it to have the to to, to get to, to get the benefit of the 5G devices. So it is a bit of a chicken and egg story at the moment. Um, I hear a few different conflicts from around the world. I read that T-Mobile in the States, about 50% of their traffic is now, of their data traffic is now on 5G. And I was talking to some of my European friends, and they're saying 1%. So obviously the 5G is still very, it's very developmental in other parts of the world. Um, it's not a case of build it and they will come because it's just so expensive to roll out a 5G network. It, never mind the fact that you need to get the spectrum from the government. That, that's, that's problem number one. But even getting beyond that, to roll out a whole new, uh, 5G there is, is is going to be a bit tricky, and then of course there are some problems as well around the fact if you've got a, a ZT or a Huawei network in 4G and 3G, and now you want to move to 5G, what vendor are you going to pick? That, that, that's another little concern that we have in, in in different markets. So the 5G picture is not completely clear just yet. Um, I think the ecosystem needs to develop more. Also, there's also a, a business case. We, we we have to see a, a return for our money before the operators invest, you know, 20, 30 million dollars in a in a in a technology. Um, it's great. I love 5G. It gives you more bandwidth. We get new spectrum. You know, the latency is better. You know, as an engineer, it's a great, it's a great, uh, it, it obviously, it's in the same way that 2G led to 3G led to 4G. There will be 5G in the Caribbean. There's no doubt. It's just a matter of when. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, uh, Rafael, what, what are your views on, on this? Yeah, basically here in, in the Dominican Republic, we have a couple of companies that are deploying 5, uh, 5G and have have the the services running, but as 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 Stephen said, um, 
there's not enough data or, or, or equipments that, that are connected to that network right now. So we need to wait. And I think that, that 5G is the right way to go. And we're going to have a lot of bandwidth to play around. And let's see if, 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 we, if we complete the, the promise with it. So. Mm -hmm. OK. Um... I see some, there are some questions coming from, from the audience. I, I see a question here for, for Xavier. I, I'll move to that question uh, before we, we end the debate, but I want to stay first on, on the 5G wireless uh, theme uh, since we're on it. And, and Xavier, do you think uh, wireless operators can also aspire to offer reliable OTT pay TV services? Is that something that they can aspire to as well? It's a, you know, it is a topic of, you know, this year, I think. Um, we have a number of customers today that have deployed um, our product to sell fixed line customers and they're asking us, okay, can I use the same product to deliver the video proposition to my brand new 5G network, right? Mm -hmm. So customers like, um, I don't know, TELUS, for example, in Canada, um, you know, we're having this, this conversation with them as we speak, right? So this is happening. Um, I think there are two things around 5G. Um, the first one is the networks are more open, right? So it becomes easier to go and deploy CDN capacity, for example, close to the end user to deliver this right quality of experience. So that's, you know, the first thing. The second thing is linked to the business case, right? Like uh, Stephen and um, and uh, my uh, co-presenter here, sorry, what's your name, Raphael, uh, we're saying, you know, I think the business case is important and we need to look for the right uh, application. So one example, I think that is really interesting when it comes to 5G, one of the things we've been hearing is that fixed wireless access is probably one of the main uh, applications of 5G today, right? And fixed wireless access when it comes to, to video is, you know, a good challenge. Why? Because people are basically connecting their broadband, the home broadband to a cellular network, to a mobile network, right? Fixed wireless access is replacing fiber with just, you know, 5G radio. So it becomes an interesting challenge. Why? Because the, the expectations are the expectations of a, a broadband, a fixed line customer. So connecting a TV to a broadband proposition, but the backhaul is going to be done over the mobile network, right? So if you're on your mobile, you know, and your video maybe uh, starts to be a little bit blocky or it stops and start again, you know, you're probably going to be okay with it. It's not a great experience, but that's kind of what you expect on mobile today. If your TV starts to have those problems that are related to the network, right? Sometimes you don't have enough spectrum, enough bandwidth, uh, you run into uh, more problems, um, then customers are going to be very disappointed, right? So for me, fixed wireless access is a very interesting challenge. And when I hear the likes of Verizon pushing heavily on fixed wireless access, I think Verizon in the US, they already offer um, fixed wireless access to a, a large quantity of household. I think they can connect up to 20 million households already today on fixed wireless access. I, I foresee some challenges there. I foresee basically people coming back to Verizon and saying, oh, my Netflix doesn't work very well or my Amazon Prime doesn't work very well. So I think there are going to be interesting challenges for operators to solve uh, when you start mixing 5G residential access and video. I think this is going to be a, you know, an interesting proposition over the next couple of years how do we deliver the right experience if the backhaul is on 5g and not on fiber okay um steven i see you nodding there i know you, it's your your field of expertise i don't know whether it, it, there was something that you wanted to add or it's just a agreement with uh, no i completely yeah. completely agree that when you have a house with you know four 4k televisions all doing you know 20 or 25 megabits per second i see that's one of the questions in the chat that's 100 megabits per second inside the home and maybe the cell size, which is serving 200 people, it's good for one gigabit per second. So you already use one tenth of the cell site capacity. So uh, my personal opinion is fiber to the home for uh, people's houses and then 5G when you're on the move. You know, okay. fixed wireless for 5G, maybe for your holiday home or maybe for a very remote area where you can't do fiber. But 5G for fixed wireless in the middle of a city like Kingston or Santo Domingo, I, I really can't see that working too well. Uh, other than for, you know, in, in, in a city area, in a very, very heavy, heavily built up area where, you, where they expect, you know, three, four hundred, you know, users per, per cell site with fixed wireless access. I see that being a problem exactly as having your mentions. Here in, Rafael, uh, yep. Yeah, here in Dominican Republic and in, in Wind, we serve uh, 4G for homes. And I can tell you, it's, 
it's a headache. Mm-hmm. It is. It can it, we, you can make it work, and and we have done a very decent job at it. But in cities like San Domingo, that you have tall bit buildings and all that, it's it's not a a, 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 a dream boat for for any engineer. So. Mm-hmm. Okay. You can you can you can make it work and you can have a very reliable service, but but it, it's it's complicated really. We're back uh, to a Stevens point at the beginning, right? It's easier to plug the cable inside a set top box than using yeah. the wireless, right? <laughs> yes, mm, absolutely. Uh, uh, Steven, you were talking about data rates. That, that gives me uh, the opportunity to come back to that question from from the audience. It, it, I think it's a question probably for, for you, um, Xavier Patricio Maduro, uh, director at Voice of Aruba Media Production and Communications, or Aruba to be the, the Aruba channel, is asking, uh, is there a best, rate, a best data rate uh, that you advise for a TV channel to provide to your head end in HD and 4K? Um, do we have an, an answer for, for that, uh, Xavier? Yeah, I mean, it will depend, right? Sorry, it's the, uh, you know, <laughs> very vague answer. It depends if you do live sports, if you do, uh, you know, uh, more traditional content. I think on average, I would probably say 10 megabits per second for, for HD up to 20 megabits per second for 4K. Uh, we've worked with um, companies uh, like BT in the UK, experimenting with 8K, going to 80 uh, megabits per second. But you know, it, it also depends on, you know, what yeah. you're going to do with the content, right? Is it realistic yeah. to squeeze 20 meg down the pipe? Do you have enough bandwidth available? So, you know, for me, especially working for a company specialized in delivery, you have to look at how you're going to be delivering the content. It's not necessarily the, you know, the best um, in. It's also what you're looking for is the best out. What is the best possible quality you're going to achieve, you know, on, on in the network, basically. Okay. Thanks for that. Um, we are approaching our final 10 minutes uh, of the discussion. There are a couple of things that i like to touch on with all of you really that open that to, to the entire panel. And, and one of them is advanced advertising or, or targeted advertising. Okay? We've been touching on the issue throughout uh, some specific points of the discussion. Um, Stephen, I'll, I'll ask with you, but what future opportunities do you see for pay TV companies uh, in the field of, of targeting advertising? Is, is there a new business opportunity there for pay TV operators? Oh, of course, it's, it's a huge opportunity. Um, you know, you can see the likes of how much money Google make, and a lot of people don't realize it's the, it's the pay per click and the uh, the banner at the bottom of the uh, at the bottom of the ad that make that they, they make their money on it. They're one of the richest companies in the world. <laughs> so, of course, TV operators would love to get a bit of that action. You know, we'd love to be able to say. Okay, because the guy is watching sports, it's more than likely he's going to like to drink Lucasade, you know, this kind of stuff. Uh, obviously, you know, it, it's a brilliant opportunity. Again, a business case, again, and a, a bit of a leap of faith that, you know, if, if you spend all this money on targeted advertising, will you be able to get your money back or is the demand there? But um, it's, I, I think it's a, it's a fantastic opportunity just, just, to get the, uh, to, just to get the model right, though, again, like everything else. N- not an engineering challenge, again, more of a commercial challenge, yeah. as, yeah. as I said, with our managers, you know? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, Rafael? Yeah, basically, target target advertising is 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 the best way to to do this kind of solutions. Advertising looks forward to selling those advertised products, right? Mm-hmm. And if you do it uh, targeted, it's it's gonna it's gonna have more gains. That's that's basically the idea. So. As Stephen said, it's it, that's as a commercial uh, uh, decision, and and in operations like Wins Wins uh, OTT service, it's it's a piece of cake cake to have have, have something like that working on. So mm-hmm. I think it, it's a good good thing. Javier, what do you think? In in some of the most Developed markets, clearly the U.S. is an example of that. This is already a reality, right? So what, yeah. what are your expectations for, for this? Yeah, yeah. so I think there's, um, you know, I was listening carefully to what Rafael and Stephen were saying. I think there's a big opportunity, right? We've seen it in the U.S. We've seen it with local advertising in the U.S. where cable companies have the opportunity to insert their own ads inside some of the linear channel. That's something that's been around for many, many years. 
what we're seeing now is the same thing done in Europe over uh, ABR video, right? So over streaming video, uh, we start to see basically live adverts that can be replaced by the operator. So you take, for example, at the top, I think three channels in France and the top four operators in France, they decided to work together on a standard so that the live um, ads can be replaced on the fly with more targeted ads, right? And this is a very positive model. This is a way of working where basically, like Raphael was saying, we create more value. It's more interesting for the advertiser that, you know, to know that you may be, I don't know, a BMW, um, you know, customer, right? So I will target you with the more premium German cars, for example, right? This is more interesting for the advertiser. They're going to pay more money. And that means that there is money both for the channel, right? Who owns the content, you advertising in the channel's content. You don't have the rights as an operator to replace their adverts with your own adverts. What you're providing is the ability to do that at scale and with the right quality. So the way it works is you actually replacing those ads on behalf of the channel and they give you a cut. It's a revenue share for the operator mm -hmm. to deliver video. So we see a big opportunity, I think, Orange was talking about 100 million impressions done last year, uh, just in France. So that is a big number. But when we look at the overall scale, that's probably about 0.5 of a person, maybe 1% of the total um, capabilities, right, of the platform. So I think we're going to start seeing a big ramp up when it comes to targeted advertising. And, and again, with a specific role for the operator, which is going to basically enable, you know, picking the best adverts, you know, with the technology deployed inside its own network. So, um, you know, manifest manipulation and the analytics are very important when it comes to, to advertising, but also enriching um, the request, right? So when I go and ask an, for an advert uh, on the, you know, from a campaign manager, I can say, look, this is a customer living in this area. And I know that this area is probably a little bit more wealthy than the average, for example. So this is, again, very valuable for the advertiser. And I think going forward, you know, when you start thinking, you know, if the world moves every, everything to IP, if we see a lot more ABR video being delivered, this creates, again, more opportunity for operators to work with traditional broadcasters, right? Being able to scale video delivery for the broadcasters and being able to scale also the advertising for broadcasters. So uh, yeah, a big topic for us and a lot of traction, at least in Europe here today. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, thanks thanks for that. Um, one final question. I'll ask each of you to, to be brief, um, less than one minute each, please. A general question. What do you think are the biggest, I'll ask you to provide just one big challenge uh, that you see on the horizon for telecom operators in the Caribbean. It doesn't necessarily have to be video, broadband connected. Thinking of operators, the biggest challenge on the horizon in the Caribbean. Stephen? A, a big debate about whether we, we keep offering linear TV or not. Do okay. we just be, a, just we be a broadband provider and let the customers go and pick their Hulu, their, their Amazon, their Netflix themselves? Or do we stay in that business and uh, and uh, and continue to provide a linear service to our customers? We are Cable Bahamas, so I keep reminding my guys, we were a cable TV company that went into docs, went into data. Now we need to become a data company that does TV on the side. <laughs> so we're, 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 we're facing a tipping point now in how, how we change our approach. And the question is going to be, in five or 10 years' time, are we still going to be in the cable TV business? Or are we still going to be just a broadband provider? With all the but all the extra services that that uh, that uh, that, uh, that that ancillary service that we provide with that so that's where I see the future that's the big kind of debate at the moment for me and, and, and in my mind. Okay, almost an existential uh, uh, issue there. So interesting. And uh, Raphael. Yeah, and the and the 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 challenge is it's it's very clear. It's content. The, all content providers wanna 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 start playing in the game and and not not sharing with with the small ones so that's going to be our main 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 challenge almost all the way until something happens i don't know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay good point too xavier i leave you the final 60 seconds to let us know what in your view is the biggest challenge for operators in in the caribbean yeah, I think it's changing the model, 
right? So I'm um, back to what um, Stephen was saying and also Raphael here. It's not necessarily one or the other doing video or broadband. Um, it's not necessarily looking at the content cost rising. I think it's about finding models where, you know, the networks can be used to deliver the right experience. So the combination, the collaboration I talked about earlier, changing the model where, you know, the OTT providers don't have to work with the global CDNs and instead can leverage basically what is already being deployed by the ISPs. So local CDN, multicast distribution for at the end, providing a better experience and also potential revenues for the ISPs. I think that's, that's the main challenge today. Okay. Um, Stephen, Rafael, Xavier, it's been a very, very interesting uh, debate, high level. Uh, we appreciate your expertise on, on these issues. Thank you very much. Thank you to our audience. Uh, we invite you to stay tuning for our upcoming uh, session. Promises to be also very interesting. We're going to be discussing streaming and free to air ecosystems. So please do stay tuned. Again, Stephen, Rafael, Xavier, thanks a lot. Thank you, guys. Brilliant. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Take everybody. care. Bye-bye.